All right, let's continue on with the Chip 8 emulation interpretation here. Before I go right into sound, I had one small kind of bug, kind of issue. From last time, I'm doing, when I'm getting the, the time difference after running a frame's worth of instructions, for however many instructions we have set, I'm doing divide by 1000. That actually should be multiplied by 1000 to convert these frame differences into a millisecond value that we divide by the performance frequency, which I'm assuming is in terms of milliseconds, the number of counts per second, and then that would give a more accurate delay here. So, as it is right now, if we divide by a thousand, it probably gives a very small delay or just goes to zero and it waits a full 16, whereas this would be more accurate and wait for a portion, you know, of 16 milliseconds less than just the full 16. Anyway, we need to convert that correctly to a thousand in terms of milliseconds, not dividing by, so multiply it. Okay, so other than that, I want to get uh, sound support working. The Chip 8 had, for all I know, just a basic <laughs> beeper, a PC speaker, a piezoelectric thing, moving iron nowadays, but a little bit better in those days, a little bit louder and bigger. Um, we will need some sort of setup for that, a little bit of SDL setup up here. Yeah, we'll need an audio spec, I believe, but I'll look that up. The chip A, this doesn't have it. SDL wiki, just under the audio page, I think. I go to audio, yeah, here. So audio init, we already initialized audio with init SDL, that is down here. But we will have to initialize some other stuff for audio. So we have the window, the renderer, to do audio stuff. We'll do audio stuff there. So <laughs> we have different audio formats we can do. This is how. SDL stores theirs internally in two bytes. Um, I'm going to use, I think, either native byte order or I'll probably do Little Indian. So Audio S16 LSB. I'm going to do signed 16-bit samples and Little Indian byte order. We could do 8-bit as well, but I'll do just signed 16-bit to be different. <laughs> I've seen examples that use that, so I'm going to use that. Uh, we're checking formats here. So how do you actually get audio working and set up? We'll need an audio spec, which is a, a struct of info that tells SDL what kind of audio we want to play. Are we going to do mono or stereo, for example, the number of channels, what kind of format, which I just looked at, probably 16-bit signed values, uh, the frequency, the samples per second. So this would be digital signal processing, I guess, is DSP. This would be... Um, like the CD or DVD quality, 44,100 or 48,000 hertz. Yeah, that is the frequency. So I'll just do 44,100, that's fine. I'll keep some uh, lower fidelity for our fancy mono square waves that I'm gonna do. I'll just do mono, one channel. Audio buffer silence value, I don't think we really have to calculate that usually. The number of samples we want to provide at once for this, and powers of two this doesn't have yeah it has it on this page the format the channels is the number of output channels samples is a unit of audio data okay so we're going to use open audio device to kind of open one you can also set up for recording as well like from the mic or something but i'm just going to do playback from speakers i'll be doing one open audio device call and a close audio device call at the end which they don't have on this page but we'll do that later um, we can provide a callback which if it's null, you can use something else like uh, queuing data on your own. But I'm going to use the callback just because I've used it before, so I kind of know how it works. And this will be a function that you provide. This will be a function pointer, effectively, uh, that STL will call when it needs more audio data. So when your speakers are supposed to be playing something and you don't have anything to play, it'll call this callback internally on a separate thread. And in this callback, the function that you set up you are provided a sort of a buffer that you fill with data that you want to play. So you fill in the music or the audio data. For our case, I'm going to generate some square wave, just numbers, just bytes, fill up a buffer in the inside of this callback, and then SDL will use that to play audio when it needs to. Otherwise, you can send a null for this to not use a callback, and you can use something else like cue audio, which... I don't know if they mention it down here, but you can queue up your own audio on a set interval instead of using a callback if you want. I'm just going to use the callback because I've used it before. So this is the signature for it. You're given just a, a whatever <laughs> pointer that you can fill with something that you want. 
to use. Maybe this would be a pointer to a buffer for like a, a song or something that you're going to play. So a stream, this is the buffer that SDL uses internally for audio. So you fill out the data in this stream according to the number of bytes for this length, however big the stream is. And if it's zero, it'll be silence. But if you fill out actual bytes, that will be the data that's going to play from the audio device that this is connected to. I'm, I'll be doing playback, so it'll be my speakers. You fill out audio specs user data field if you want that to be passed in. So I'm going to use the callback and I'll have some user data. So we'll fill out this field within the audio spec struct and that will be passed on to the callback when needed. So okay. Probably a little, a little bit much, a little bit over your head because it's a little bit over my head, but that's okay. So we'll have some audio spec sort of structs here. We'll have an audio device ID, um, int, I guess, which we'll use in open audio device, and that'll return something there. And just a, a device number, a unique number for this device. And then open audio device, we'll look at that. That's how we actually open it. So you can give a null or you can give a, a number or specific name or driver name. Okay, I'll just do null. Um, capture, so capture would be if it's for recording and not playback. I'll do zero, because I'm gonna be playing back, not recording through the mic or anything. Um, audio spec desired is the audio that you want to have after you fill out the frequency, the format, the channels, the samples. So I'm gonna say we wanna get like some sort of mono square wave audio. I'll fill out, you know, 44, 100, um, audio S16 LSB in channels one. That's what we want to have. And then you send back obtained, which is what SDL comes up with that you can actually get in this case. And if you allow changes between what you want and what you get. Um, I'll do a zero and then we'll just error if we don't get the right thing. And I'll, you know, <laughs> say that's a, someone else's problem if we don't get that. That's effectively what we're going to be doing. I have some things here. Samples should be in terms of milliseconds, so if you want to calculate the number of uh, time that you have for audio that you want to play, you can take your sample frames times a thousand, so in terms of milliseconds, divided by frequency, our frequency being 44,100 or 48k. Uh, silence, if you want to set it to silence, uh, you don't initialize, okay, so you don't initialize silence, never mind, don't do that. Callback and stuff, okay, so we'll fill out some of these. You can call pause audio device. You can lock it if you need to do sort of atomic changes. I'm not going to be locking and unlocking. That prevents the callback from being called if you lock it. When you unlock it, the callback can be called to fill out more audio. But I think that's more for threading and like atomic needs. If you have multiple things playing for multiple audio devices, I think that's useful for that. But I'm just going to do one device. I know I'm looking at this and not programming yet. I'm just trying to get my get it laid out in my head first. <laughs> Pause audio device will play. So you get an audio device ID from open audio device. You use that inside of pause. And pause on, you can pass non-zero or zero. So kind of like a Boolean. And that will stop the audio playing or it will start the audio playing. So one will stop, zero will start it. They have a delay, okay. All right, so let's lay out some audio specs here. Like this, want to have in an audio device ID device. I'm going to put this within our SDL struct here. So I'll say want and have. Are these pointers? No. Okay. And I'll have SDL audio device ID. I'll say device. And we'll fill these out as needed. So I'll do that within initialize SDL. We'll initialize audio stuff. So we'll have SDL want, I'll fill that out here. Can probably just do designated initializer, that's fine. So what do we have? We have the frequency that we want to use. So freak, 44,100 hertz. Do CD quality. We have the format that we want to do. I'm going to do, it's audio S16 LSB, not LSD, not LSD Dream Simulator. Yeah, 
doing little Indian because I'm on x86. We could do SYS and not have to mess with it if we move to a big Indian platform. Or we can do 8 bits and not have to mess with it, but I'll do LSB. And we have the number of channels and the number of samples. So 1, sign 16 bit, little Indian. So mono, one channel. Samples uh, should be power of two. I think the SDL docs say usually between 512 and 8192 are common values here. Uh, the lower the value, the less it's going to call the callback with in general. So the lower the latency in general, because you're not going to be using as much at a time. Um, but the higher the amount, the more you can probably put in the buffer at once that it'll queue up for. And you'll have higher latency, but more playtime. So I guess you kind of want to make a trade off there. I'm going to do 4096 just as a, a middle value here. And I'll set up a callback as well. We'll say this is, I don't know, so we'll just call like a function that'll be audio callback. <laughs> so we wrote this function somewhere. All right, that is what we want. What we have, we don't have anything at the moment. So we pass that into open audio device with our audio device ID. So that'd be SDL dev. This is open audio device. So null, I'll pass zero, want, have, and we could allow a change. We could not allow any changes. Forget what all the flags are for that. That's an open audio device. Allow any change. We could just use a zero, right? Yeah, we could just put zero there. Okay. So pass it the address of our wants, the address of what we have or what it has. Yeah, we want the address because that isn't a pointer. Okay. What we'll actually get, what we'll have, and I'll just do zero for that. So I believe this returns, it returns an audio device ID. So. If the ID is greater than zero, then we're good. If it's zero, it will be a failure. Get error for more info. Okay. So we'll never return one. That's the legacy for this, because you can only have one audio device with open audio. So I could use that for an easier function, but that's okay. This one's newer and more powerful. So check if it's greater than zero. So if it's not greater than zero, then we had an error. So I'll do that. We'll say, put that up there. So you could not get an audio device. Go get error, return false. Otherwise, um, otherwise we can error if we don't have what we wanted. So we can put if SDL want does not equal what we have. Well, we could check like formats and things for this. Yeah, we, we could just have a way to check if we got like the stuff that we wanted, like if these values are the same. I guess we could check that. I don't know if they'll all be the same, but we could check. Um, and there's not really a, a thing to check directly if they're both equal without going through all these. So I guess the frequency, I don't really care if it's different. The channels, I do. I'm just gonna put an error here if we got, you know, anything that's not right. Say if the format's wrong, I guess format should have gone first, but that's all right, we'll do that. If we wanna be in order here, the format doesn't equal, if the channels don't equal, if the samples don't equal, I guess I don't care too much for that, just more for the format and the channels. Yeah, the other ones are okay. We'll say, could not get desired audio spec. 
We'll just say that. I guess we don't really have an error there. It's just we could not get it. Okay, otherwise we did, and we have the device. The device was opened. Okay, so when we close everything down... Okay, so when we go to our cleanup here, we do have to close the audio device that we just opened, which I believe is called the SDL Close Audio Device. So I'll go do that. This doesn't have close on it, I don't think. Yeah, it does. And we just pass the device into there. All right, and that'll be sdl.dev, right? Yeah. Okay. So I need to set up a callback to fill in some audio according to our audio spec, because we set that up. Uh, I will fill out the user data as well, actually, in here, because we're passing in config. I'm just going to have the address of config. Which, does that work? We're passing it as a value. Well, we're, no, we're saying it's constant. That should be okay. I think that'll be okay. I'm going to pass the address to config because we can fill out some, uh, some user configurable values, like, say, for the volume that we're currently playing at or the, the specific tone or frequency of the wave that we're going to play. I'm just going to do that. Pass to audio callback. Okay, so since I need this available here, I'm going to put it before this function. So I'm going to say this is our STL audio callback function. And I'll call it, well, I did call it audio callback. So it comes with void pointer user data as a un8 t pointer stream and an int length. So the length of the stream, which is the audio buffer, and the user data, which is going to be our config. So config t, this is going to be a pointer. Like I could do that. Uh, we have to fill out the stream with data, so how do we do that? I don't quite remember. I know I, I looked up some, <laughs> some other people that did this, like uh, this person. So what is this, davidgao.net? When he was doing Handmade Hero stuff for Linux, the first few episodes, he did some SDL stuff, so I was looking at his sort of audio parts. I think this is, yeah, number seven and eight. So I'll put a link to this because it was pretty helpful. He explains the SDL audio spec and, and everything. So if you want to have silence, you can just set the whole audio data buffer to, you know, to zero. If you didn't get the format you wanted, so he's doing that. Pause audio will have to do. Pause audio, yes or no. But we have a different thing. I think it's pause audio device, right? I can put that in right quick, because I know we'll be using that. Let me do that first, because that's easier. Uh, with data. Let's do that first. There's a couple of things I get at, I have to set up first before we can fill out the audio buffer. Um, if we're playing sound, I'm going to call STL pause audio device, given our device, which I don't have. I need to set the device here, so we'll call update timers with that. Let's do STL T STL. We're not going to change what the device is, so I could I could make that constant. That's okay. There we go, we'll do that. So we'll pass in the device, and if we want to play, I think we do zero. Yeah, pass the device, and pass an int, zero to unpause, non-zero to pause. Okay, so zero to unpause. Else we'll stop playing, we'll do one. Pause sound. Okay, I think calling it repeatedly with the same value is okay. It's not going to, like, clip or make, you know, bad sounds or anything. It just won't unpause it if we call this repeatedly. And if we call play repeatedly, it's, it's okay. So that shouldn't cause any issues, like, with 
weird sounds or clipping or anything. So I just have fill this out with data. Okay. So what data are we going to fill? We're going to fill out a square wave, but what sort of square wave do we want? What frequency do we want that square wave to be? Like for a standard A, it's going to be 440 hertz, for example. And what volume do we want it to be at? I'm going to have those be configurable values, so I'm going to add them to the config struct here. Again, I'll probably just make uint 32s that's fine. So I'm going to have square wave uh, frequency. So, you know, frequency of square wave sound. G440 hertz for A, for middle A. And I'm going to have a volume. Since I'm going to work with 16-bit little Indian values, this can be 16-bit for, well, this could be 18. I mean, this could be an int, actually, I think. I'm not sure what negative volume would be converted into. Well, we, we could probably have negative volume, actually. It'd be the lower part of the audio wave, right? Below zero. So I, I think, actually, we could do that. Or it might just be zero is going to be silence and int max. <laughs> Short max for this case, because it's 16-bit, would be loudest. I'm not sure. Or int 16 max, whatever the limits value is. That might be how volume works. We're sending bytes to a data buffer, ultimately. So the max value for that, for would be like the highest volume of the wave we're playing. I think the lowest value would be the lowest volume. I'm not sure if it clips off and like stops at zero or something though. I'm not sure what a negative volume would be, but uh, I don't know. We'll just, we'll set it to this, I guess, because N16 is the range of values we're going to send to it. <laughs> How loud or not is the sound? Let's go to set config this function so we can set some uh, some defaults for those. So we ended on that. So square wave frequency and volume. Let's say it's 440, 440 hertz for middle A. And volume, I think two or three thousand from what I remember was an okay range. Because the max is going to be, uh, what, 32,767, right? Yeah, because 16-bit max would be 65, 535, 64K. So half of that would be int 16. But I believe, like, int 16 max, or whatever the actual name for this is, would be max volume. So this will be a good deal lower than that, so it won't blow out your eardrums or kill your speaker, hopefully. <laughs> But okay, how do we fill this out with data? I was using that guy's sort of, using that guy's page to look at this, queuing and pausing audio, we're doing that. So let me go to the next page here, where he actually filled some stuff out in a callback. Or at least he's filling out samples. I didn't do exactly what he did, but I did similar kind of stuff before. And then older uh, emulator that I've done. So I'll probably use like the stuff that I did for this. <laughs> Similarly, that's why I chose 3000 for the volume, for example. This is my code I've done before, but I could not be arsed to remember that, so <laughs> I'll use this and uh, just also know that I use this guy's stuff as, as a resource as well. So samples per second, you were doing 48k tone hertz, I'm doing 440. We have the volume, a running index, which is going to be the index of the next one we're going to generate. We have to preserve this across writes, or the wave would not be consistent cross right boundaries. We might have a high value that's longer than normal or a lower off value if we're doing square waves that's longer than normal, unless we make this consistent or a static variable. In other words, we can do that or global. Square wave period is the period in samples, samples per second over tone hertz. Then we get half of the period, okay. If it's for a square wave, if it's high or low. The number of bytes per sample. Mine's going to be one, so I don't need this value because I'm just doing mono, not stereo. Uh, otherwise, SDL expects if you do two channels, for example, a left channel and then a right channel, so LR, 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 where you can think of mono as just being all Ls or all Rs. I mean, it's duplicated between both sides for speakers anyway. But okay, then he has the number of bytes they're actually going to write, buffer size or something. So he's filling this out. 
Um, I know what I did before worked, so I'm going to use what I did. <laughs> we'll have the user data that we can use. So I'll get some data for the stream. So an int pointer, well, int 16. I'll just say data, audio, data, audio buffer. Because I'm working with sine 16 bit bytes here, little Indian. So that's the data that I'm going to be filling out. So I can fill out two bytes at a time to the stream, even though it's laid out in one byte at a time as a pointer. That's okay. I'll put this fill out stream audio buffer with data. Uh, I guess we'll be changing the value, so I don't want to do that. Okay. I have a running sample index like that guy was doing. I don't remember why I did all these, so I'll try to explain. <laughs> we need that preserved across boundaries. So I'm just going to keep an index to the, the current byte or the current data within the audio stream that we're doing. So if we're generating a square wave, we want to keep the consistency across calls to this callback. So if we end uh, the previous call to this and the square wave data was high, we want to you know ensure that we know it was high when we come back to here or if it was low, vice versa. So this would prevent some odd audio issues, like either skipping or delays or something not sounding quite right. We'll keep that, we'll keep a running sample index in there. So we have the volume from config, which is going to be where we passed in the user data. Um, square wave period they did as well. And a half square wave period. Okay. So our frequency divided by our square wave frequency. So and those aren't global, so we'll have to get those from somewhere. I'll just put those here. So I'll put it's a square, so put square wave period equals something, and we'll have half of that. So the reason I have to do half is because we're filling in either high or low <laughs> for the square wave that we're going to be playing. And the period is, you know, the crest to crest or the trough to trough of a wave. That's going to be square wave period over two. So we have to go by half of the period, not just the full period. But I can explain that more in a second when we're writing this stuff out. Because I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to put that in there because I don't have... I'll probably have to copy the period into my config struct because I'm not using globals, and in this case I was using globals. So we'll fill out the data in the bytes in the stream. Which I just used an int less than length because length is an int, yep. i less than length over 2, i++. Plus plus. Filling out two bytes at a time. Length is in bytes, so divide by two. Okay, then we fill in the bytes. So audio data i, so what byte of the square wave, what data do we need to actually put in there? Well, we have a volume that we're working at, and the square wave is either fully on or fully off. Uh, probably help if I like, that's why I had this paint window up. <laughs> Oh, that's not really straight. Can I do shift? No. Probably have to use a line tool for that. Oh, well. So we have a square wave like this. Um, you have a wave and it has amplitude, which is the height. I guess it would be an invisible line going through here. Half of it would be going up, right? And half of it would be going down. Either one of these is going to be considered the amplitude of the wave or the total volume. A square wave is only going to be fully off or fully on or yeah. Fully on would be at the top, fully off would be at the bottom. This is known as, you know, the crest of a wave. And this is the trough of a wave. And the, the period of a wave, the period of time, if we say this is here, this is like time. This is amplitude, effectively, kind of. If it's the full thing, it's over two, but this is amplitude here. So going through time, one full period of the wave is going to be the time from one crest to the next crest, or one trough to the next trough. That's one full period, this whole thing. 
And if you consider that we're going to be high or low or on or off only half of the time, we could take like one of these waves, like this wave here. If we cut it in two, half of this is going to be low and half of it's going to be high on either side. If we, if we look at that in a different way, let's say over here, we're going to have either this or this, right? To make one full wave. Let's just look at the left part here. We're high or up or on half the time and we're low half the time. So we need to write a byte of data for the half of time that we're high and the, another byte of data for half the time that we're low, or in our case, two bytes because I'm doing 16 bit little Indian bytes. So we take the full period, we're dividing by two for half of the period. That is why I'm doing half of the period here that I'm going to be putting into this data that we're going to put in. So I need to see which we're going to increase the next index. So we we're saying we're writing some data into here. I'm dividing that index by half of the period and checking if it's even or not. Okay. So half square wave period, divide that all, divide by two. If it's true volume, else negative volume. So divide that by half. Square wave period. Mod two, or we can do and with one, but that's fine. Is that positive? So I'm checking the next byte or the next two bytes in our case, just the next chunk of data that we're writing for this square wave. Are we writing the high part of the wave or the low part of the wave? So according to the, the running index, which is going to be starting at zero, so zero divided by whatever is going to be zero. We'll do the low part of the wave, which will be negative volume, else we're going on the next one. Well, maybe it'll start at one. I don't know. But on one of the next ones, it'll be like two or four. It'll be even. So if we divide by half of this and it's even, then we'll be writing the high part of the wave, the, the top volume. And the frequency that our wave goes from on to off or high to low, you know, however many times a, a second, that frequency gives us the sound, right? So if this is true, we'll say we're on the high part of the wave. We'll be writing the data, which is going to be config volume positive volume otherwise we'll do we'll do negative volume which looks a little odd but that's all right and that will be writing all of our data so i'm going to put it kind of like this which might be a little easier to read i don't know <laughs> so it's kind of odd but since square wave alternates between high and low that's sort of how you do it but not too bad so how do we get the actual square wave period We'll need like our, our period frequency. So I'm not going to be able to fit it in here. This isn't going to work because we're not calling it, but I'll just put this here until I figure out how to change it. <laughs> so our audio spec would be what we have. That's going to be divided by our sample rate, square wave frequency. Not our sample rate, our square wave frequency. Okay. should be in config. So the, the full period that we calculate for a wave is going to be how fast the audio is going in general, which is going to be our sample rate. So 44,100 hertz. So 44,100 times a second, we'll have something going. And how many somethings is going to be our square wave frequency. So 44100 divided by 440 hertz. different frequencies would give, you, would give you different amounts. Um, this is all set up to be okay right now, but I do have to think how I'm going to get this. I could set this within config so that we can pass in user data, or I could set user data as like to another pointer somewhere. Uh, we, could, we could make a struct that contains the SDL and config data and just point it at there. I didn't think this through enough, obviously, because I need to pass this in somehow. How would I do that? I'll just add it to config. I'll say we'll, we'll fudge it a little bit. It's kind of bad, but that's all right. I'll say audio sample rate, because that's what it's going to be. We'll say audio sample rate. That's, that's not too bad. Do we initialize config after or before SDL? This is before. 
I kind of want to get the one that we actually have. So I might do that after, but we do need that for SDL. Um, well, I'm, I'm erroring out if we don't get the right rate, right? Yeah, I'm doing an error with an init SDL if we don't get the right format already, which I probably made mistakes and have to fix. Yeah, I'll do that in a second. But since I'm doing that, then we're guaranteed if it goes through that we'll have this frequency, so I'm just going to set it to this. That's what I'll do. Then I don't have to worry about it. And that is what square wave frequency above audio sample rate. Audio sample rate, we'll say CD quality. Okay. So that way in the callback, we'll get the right period according to the wave that we're going to play. We'll have the volume that we're going to play. So this will be config audio sample rate. And we could determine this, you know, outside of this function so we don't have to calculate it every single time, but oh well. <laughs> it, won't, it won't slow it down too much, I don't think. But that would be like a bad thing we could fix. Discards const qualifier user data equals ampersand config. Oh, this one? Const qualifier. I, I guess so, yeah, whatever, okay. We won't do a constant then. That's true, it, it would get rid of it, that's true. First use, did you mean div? No, did I call it wrong? That's div. Pause audio device. Oh, I need to pass it in there. 960950. Yes. When we're pausing the audio, the audio device, I have to qualify that. Okay. And there we go. So if all goes well, we should have some sound playing. It might not be true. So I'm not absolutely sure, but <laughs> maybe we will. Maybe we won't. I can see if the test ROMs work. I don't think they play any sound, though. But we can... We can test. And AX still is kind of buggy. That's all right. I know we passed it. Coder, okay. So let's see if sound works. So it's chip eight ROMs, games. I know Bricks plays sound, I believe. Or Breakout, we have actual Breakout. I think this plays sound, if I remember the controls. I hear a, a clipping sound trying to play, so I think I might have done it wrong because <laughs> it doesn't work there. I know it plays if you lose the ball, so I can see. And I can turn off the debug stuff because that's annoying and we're not using it. This is also a little slow, so let me change those first. Um, set config. Let me set the speed a little bit faster. That one guy says 700 per second, so I'm going to go with that. Change that to 700. I'll do a regular make so we don't have the debug stuff. That should speed it up a little bit as well. So it's Q and E. That speeds it up. Floating point exception. Well, we have an issue now, don't we? <laughs> That's always good. I'm probably not doing the audio correctly, to be honest, because that's where it failed. I believe this stuff is okay. Audio sample, yeah, divided by the square wave, and that's that over two. I see if it's a positive or not, we'll play the volume. Should be 3,000 or negative 3,000. So possibly something with the user data is not great, maybe. Possibly. I did say it was for this, and that would probably be on the stack, right? So that may be the issue. So that's going to be a pointer. Let's set it to config, and I'm going to make that a pointer. So that'll be the value of the pointer, so that will be set there. I think 
that'll be okay. That way we have the actual address. That'll at least rule out that it was bad or not. Config is a pointer, yes. Five. Now I have to change these. And not do that. I just want to do a C. Can I not do that? Okay. Never mind. Where? Oh, scale factor as well. And it might be because I'm recording with OBS as well. It won't be great. There we go. So you can hear it a little bit. Probably. I can turn the volume up, of course. It is delayed, but this happened before when I was doing this. That the sound is just going to be delayed. You can see it um, really, really pronounced because I have, I think it's UFO. So this thing, right when you shoot, right, is supposed to make a sound right when you shoot this. And this is what the guy was playing that 1978 picture on Wikipedia. It's supposed to play sound right when you shoot. But it's not. See, it's delayed by half a second. Now, I've had that happen before in this, probably just because I'm running a virtual machine from my host OS, and then I'm running this within this virtual machine, so it's slow. So I'll take the current code I have here. I'm going to put it over to my host, probably with just SCP. Unknown conversion from character Z. Oh, does Windows have different... <laughs> Windows has different size of conversions, really? Oh, that's lame. I thought this would be cross-platform. What is printf size T? I thought it was ZU. Just do it and not support ZU. Cast to an int and use D. Okay, well, I might just do that. Uh, okay, well, we gotta, make, we gotta make this work on both, hopefully, but I guess I'll change this. This is only at 201. So this is fun. So it doesn't take ZU for the size. I guess it's LU on Windows. It says LLU, actually. Size T. Size T is a long, long unsigned in. So he uses LOU. Okay. So the ROM greater than the max. Is that good? Okay, that looked like that works. If I try to run chip 8, we'll still get the same thing. So, okay, that was the only issue there. Let's make sure the other things work. The IBM logo, that works. All right. BC test, that works. And the test op code, that works. And that works a little bit better on Windows as well. That's good. But it's on my host machine, so it's probably just speed related. So let's see if that plays now. This should play with sound. No, it's still delayed. Okay. I may have to mess with like buffer values. The sound plays. It's louder as well. Let's go back. Let's try UFO. That'll determine if it's a thing or not. So that plays instantly. I mean, very slightly delayed. I'm trying to see. Timing. Timing games were not always my best, but I try. So that plays immediately when I shoot the rocket, but on bricks it does not play, and I think because it's calling and pausing a lot, a lot more, according to how fast our CPU and everything's going. So I don't know if that would be an audio issue specifically on a per game basis, or just overall with how I've architected this in a, in a bad way. <laughs> but we do have sound, it does work, it's just delayed a little bit.
Uh, we could work on reducing the the audio buffer, hopefully for less latency. I'm not sure if that would fix it or not. So the buffer being, I know this is small, sorry about that, but I'm gonna change the, what am I gonna change? The sample size? I'm gonna try this at 512 instead of 4096, where we get the STL-want audio spec. I'll see if 512 makes that any different. It probably won't, but you never know, because the video loads. So that does actually speed it up. Okay, so 512 may be the way to go because that seems to be, have a lot less of a delay here. Okay. So I think I'm gonna go with 512 instead of 4096. I didn't think it would have that big of a, an effect to be honest. And if this is really loud in post, I'll reduce the volume of the square wave. I know it's louder on, on this. Oh, I thought I was going to get that one. That's all right. There we go. So, okay. Um, that's going to be it for sound, <laughs> believe it or not. Sound isn't too bad, but that's all right. Any any issues that I need for uh, Linux versus Windows, so they're doing an LOU instead of a ZU, I can try that here because I really want something that works on both with minimal problems. So that says, nope, it's actually different. Okay. That's not fair. Do we need a, an issue there? I could cast it. I mean, LOU is what works on Windows. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cast those, actually. That makes it easier than dealing with it. Let's be long, long, unsigned. We haven't found any ROMs that are too big anyway. That way it works on both, so I don't have to do an if diff windows or anything there. 4096, this samples here. Let's try 512. And we'll try to run. Try to run bricks here again. We'll see on here. This will be a lot slower because it's multiple VMs and emulation things. And it's quieter. There's still a bit of a delay. But I'm gonna I'm gonna mark that down to putting this within a VM and then emulating it again because I don't want to blame myself for being too bad of a programmer, even though that's probably more more so the reason. But on, on Windows on my host, the audio is fine with the lower samples there. And it is a little bit less of a delay even on here. It's just not as as good as it should be. Try UFO, which doesn't exist because I don't have the chip 8 on there. Yeah, I still have a delay, but... Okay, I'm going to say other than the delay, I'll, I'll look into that a little bit, but we did get sound working to some extent. It does work, and we can change the, uh, the frequency if you want a, a, something that is different than A. You can change the frequency of the note there. I don't know if I have, yeah, still have a page on that from when I was doing audio stuff. So I'll link this in the description as well because it's just general frequencies we can use. So I'm using 440 hertz for A, A4. So if you want something, you know, you can go with a minor key. You want something uh, slower, a slower frequency will be less waves in one second, lower energy, and it will be a lower sounding note. So a higher frequency is more energy, more waves in one second. It'll be a higher note up here this is very high <laughs> so if you want if you want something if a is too harsh or something you can do a lower thing and if you want to hear what they sound like uh, i thought i had a tone generator do i not have that no i know there's pages for this yeah I'll mark this down so i have it my tone generator say so you want to like 230 hertz you know, we'll have that, but you can set whatever. We're doing 440. And we're doing a square wave, which is very harsh. But yeah, okay. So that's audio, that's audio stuff. What else was I gonna look at? Either passing stuff on the command line or fading out, doing linear interpolation, I guess. 
So I'll see if we can reduce the flickering. That sounds more interesting. The linear interpolating from a uh, our foreground color to background to our background color over time. I'm gonna mess with that a little bit just because I haven't done that before, so I can't rightly explain it right now and code it up within like an hour. <laughs> so uh, I'm gonna do that, and I'll be back in a bit or maybe tomorrow, depending how long it takes to get a good example. Um, and I'll see you then. That will still be part of this video. I'm not leaving. I'll be back in one second. I just gotta you know mess with this for a little bit. So yeah, thanks for watching so far. All right, I'll continue with this once again. I think I'm gonna try some rudimentary linear interpolation for the colors between the foreground and background color to try and make the flickering a little bit less noticeable. In chip eight, the screen will refresh regardless every 60 hertz. So unless we really wanna mess with that a bit, it's not gonna be too appreciable um, of a difference. But there's some like low hanging fruit we can handle and we can do with that. And if nothing else, it'll give a I don't want to say cool, but it'll give a sort of ghosting effect. So but we'll see that in a bit. And I was testing with things earlier. Uh, for this, there's one initial thing I want to sort of fix right off the bat. And that is for debugging. And that is that I'm not printing debugging here. I'm just doing the same, <laughs> the regular code for emulating the call to subroutine. So I noticed that it would be good to, you know, do deep audits of my code every now and then code reviews, but I don't. So... I would if I had more time, I guess. That's all right. We'll just do call subroutine at NNN just to round out these here. I think this was the only debug one that was really bad, or at least not fully correct. And the other ones should be all right. So that should, uh, you know, make that happy now. That should be all right. So to reduce flickering a little bit, uh, we can do something like set on a flag to draw to the screen or not to update the screen. I'm going to add that to our, I guess the chip eight, the chip eight struck down here. I'll make a little boolean. It'll say draw or draw flag. I'll say draw. We'll say draw to the screen or we'll say update because I called it update screen, right? Update the screen, yes, no. So there's only two instructions that really facilitate drawing from chip eight, and that's clearing the screen with um, 00E0 and the draw instruction, drawing a sprite with DXYN. So for those two instructions, I'm gonna set on this draw flag. And then when we're emulating in this emulator loop, when we go to update the screen, we can see if that draw flag is active or not. So if we want to draw, then we can draw, and then we can set it to false since it's a boolean. And that way we're only gonna update the screen one every 60 hertz, but also only if it needs to be updated. I'm assuming this will help a little bit with the flickering. It may not be noticeable, so I'm not too sure. Uh, so actually, let me do this first. Let's see if I don't mess with the draw flag. And again, we just update every 60 hertz. Let's discover, or at least let's find out if it actually affects things that much. So if I do something like UFO, uh, what would be updating a lot? Bricks, right? The Arkanoid, the Arkanoid type game. Only uses Q and E for left and right. This has a decent bit of flickering that you can tell on the, the paddle and the ball. They're kind of updated constantly when this is drawing. So we can get a good baseline here. I'm not gonna probably remember <laughs> how this looks too much for flickering. So I might add like side by sides in the video later, but at least in post editing. So this gives a decent um, a decent indication of what the flickering is from the paddle and the ball if you're moving constantly and the score updating as well. So okay, we can see if a, as a baseline, if we can improve that very slightly by only drawing when we need to draw. I'll just uncomment those out. And when we go to emulate the instructions, let's say for D here, I'll just set the draw flag on before we break. So chip eight is a pointer in here. So let's go draw equals true. We'll update screen on next 60 Hertz tick, we'll say. And we'll also put this all the way up here for 00E0, which is going to clear the screen. So only those two instructions actually affect the screen. So at the bottom, if that's true, which those are set to true, then we'll set it false. So it'll update the screen and then set that false. So as a baseline, does that improve anything at all? I'm not sure. 
Again, I'm probably not gonna notice any differences here. If there are any, there might not even be any from before. So I can check and like put side by side footage, picture in picture style here or something, but I don't think there's gonna be much of a difference, if at all. But that's all right. Uh, one, other, one other thing I wanted to add is like some more controls. So there's a very easy thing to do as far as like resetting the whole thing if we want to. I don't have a reset feature right now. I only have pause, which I think is also wrong because when I unpause, it says pause. So I might want to fix that as well. But <laughs> an easy key we can add is like a reset function or a reset key and other things for like volume or the colors or uh, our linear interpolation rate that I'm going to add in a second. So I do want to fix the pause thing because I just remembered that as another bug. I don't think I have any other bugs, hopefully. Not that I know of. It's probably a whole bunch, <laughs> but that's all right. Um, if it's running and we want to pause, when it is paused, I want to print paused. If the game is running and not paused, I don't want to print that. So, you know, easy one line change there. <laughs> but that's all right. But I'm also going to pass in maybe config for this later. Well, maybe not right now. I want a reset key. We can add in reset. That'll be easy enough. So we're already using R, so I could check for a shift key and R, or I could just use another key. I'll just do something that we're not doing, maybe equals or something, some random some random key we're not likely to press. Yeah, we can press like equals or something that's out of the way, that's hard to press, but I'm not sure what that's called as far as the STLK sort of nomenclature here. I was looking up linear interpolation. I'll get to that in a second, I think. So libstl, just go to the go to the API page. This is for api.name. Just go back to the wiki page. We'll go by, by category, keyboard support. I'll look at the key codes. Uh, it did turn out because I haven't, I need to read like these pages. <laughs> I should be using the SDL scan code actually, even though I'm lazy and like SDLK. The scan code values give you keyboard agnostic layout values for where the keys are. So instead of doing, you know, German has quirts instead of QWERTY. So if I say Y, it'll be Z on theirs, but I'm going by character for Y. So it may be better for, uh, for positioning purposes on the keyboard to use scan code. And I'm not doing that. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Uh, SD okay, so it's equals. Okay, I didn't know if it was going to be just this, you know, the symbol or spelling it out. So that's okay. We'll do equals. I'll say that's going to be the reset key. You can choose something else, of course. That's more ergonomic for yourself. So I'll put equals and I'll put reset. I'll put reset chip 8 machine uh, for the current ROM. So this will just reload everything like we just started it up with the ROM that's currently in the thing. And to do that, I'm gonna call init chip eight and not open that below, do that. So that takes in chip eight and a ROM name. So we'll just pass it in because that's coming in as a pointer and the ROM name is going to be chip eight ROM name that's already set up. So I'll just reinitialize that and then break out of there. These returns up here also uh, under SDLK space and escape. Yeah, like all these things can just be breaks. I'm not doing anything down here that I used to be doing. So I'll just make that consistent, I guess. But okay, that'll reset the thing. The only issue is that <laughs> in my testing otherwise, this doesn't fully reset because like the RAM contents are mixed up and all. I mean, I load the font. I go to init chip eight. Like I load the font here initially, but the rest of the RAM is not affected. So we kind of should clear that out as well as these things. Uh, I'm just gonna probably just mem set the whole, the whole thing before all of this, just to make sure that everything is clear. So initialize entire chip eight machine. I'm just gonna mem set the whole thing. We're passing that in already. I'll just set it all to zero. That's fine. Booleans will be set to false because that's zero. And the ROM name will be set to zero, probably, which isn't good, but we are going to set that down here, so that's okay. So we'll do size of chip 8t, because chip 8 is just the pointer. That would just be 4 or 8, which would not be good. So we'll do that first. Okay. So then when we press the equals key during runtime, it should reload the ROM and everything 
It'll reload the font, it'll reopen the file, read it in, it'll reset everything up to the entry point and the stack, and we should be okay. If I check with this game again, just as a quick aside, we'll say we lose the game and want to start over or something. So I'll just do that. These beep sounds. And one more time. I always got a max score of six, but oh, I can't move, I can't do anything. Uh, actually, other other emulators I looked at might have like a game over screen for this, but I don't know if the person implemented that, the emulator writer, or if that's part of this game, because it doesn't pop up for this. So it just seems to be an infinite loop. But okay, I'll press equal. And hey, it loads everything up again. So I think that was pretty easy. Make sure everything's fully initialized to begin with, not partially. And then just load it all up again. And you're pretty good. But okay, I'll try to do... It's not really going to reduce this flickering that much. It'll look a little bit different. Maybe you want a ghosting effect or something, though. So I'll look into linear interpolation just because I hadn't fully done it before. And I wanted to do something a little different. So let me look that up on my handy-dandy Wikipedia page that I had open a second ago. Method of curve, curve fitting, linear polynomials, constructing new data points, then range of a discrete set of known data points. While that does make sense, it's kind of, for my dumb brain, a little bit gibberishy. But basically you have two endpoints on a line and given some sort of delta, some sort of maybe time value, you want to get a point in between either of the endpoints. And you want it to be linear, it's going to, you know, linearly increase or decrease or what have you between the two points. It's not going to be exponential or anything. But you can grab any point on the line, and it's sort of deterministic. And what we can do with this is go between, you know, stuff like colors, color gradients. We can have smooth sine waves. You can have other things that affect just something changing in, a, in an even or linear fashion between two end states. So in my case, I'm going to use it for colors. I'm going to go from the foreground color to the background color. And I'll be using this lerp function. Even though my colors are going to be integers or unsigned integers, it's okay. We can still multiply by a float and it'll implicitly cast from compiler magic <laughs> and just work. So that's not going to be too bad. But I'm going to return a color, in my case, a RGB8, RGBA8888, right? 8 bit, 32 bit color. And I'll, I'll be using this sort of function. But I, I do need to change. Well, I'm not sure if I have to, but I'm going to affect each R, G, B, and A sort of portions of the overall color. So I'll be calling this function, so yeah, this statement or expression four times for each one of those and, you know, mask them and shift them, combine them into a color to leave. So instead of float V0, float V1, I'll be passing in two color values, uh, the current color that a pixel is at and the color I want it to be. So I'll probably have to add extra storage to store what color we're supposed to be drawing for this current chip 8 pixel. Uh, and some kind of value that I might just make a constant that says, hey, we're, we're going to go at this rate of change between these two colors. So I think I found like 0.5 to 0.8 tended to be okay. If you go very low, this float will be between 0 and 1. But if you go very low, you have like just a bunch of mouse trail like ghosting, which I'll show because it's kind of interesting for like shader or other purposes. But I'm hoping that a small amount makes the flickering a little better. It'll basically put in shades of gray when we move something on the screen before it fully fades out to uh, to the background color, in this case black, but it, it could be between any colors. It could be green to blue, for example, or something. Um, you could do multiple lerps between multiple colors, so you could uh, linearly interpolate between blue and yellow to orange to red, you know, make color gradients and things, but it could be used for alpha blending. I'm just gonna do opaque, so that's fine. We'll be using this. So 1 minus t times v0 plus t times v1. If you work that out, you can find, you know, a value in between v0 and v1. Typically, yeah, if they're, if they're uh, what is that again, quotient is, is less than 0, or product, if the product of them is less than 0. But okay. I'm going to make a helper function. I'm just going to put it at the top, I guess, somewhere. I'll just put it at the top. That's fine. I'll say color lerp. I don't know if it's true lerp, but I'll put lerp here. Helper function. We'll say color lerp, and I'm going to return a color from this, which in my case is going to be unt32t. 
and I'm going to take in a starting color, I'll say start color, and we want to get the point between that color and the ending color. So I'll say end color. And we want some value T or K or something. I'll just put T for lack of a better term. I'm not sure what it should be, but I'll do that. <laughs> I'm also going to have an inverse of that because they had one minus T. So I could either put one minus T everywhere would be fine, or you can have like an inverse T, which would be one minus T. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Or the reciprocal or whatever that's supposed to be, but I guess it doesn't matter too much. So I'm going to get the RGB and A values from both of these colors and then lerp between them and return a color with the lerped values. So that's all I'm going to be doing here. So sRGB and A, for example, for the start color. I'm just going to grab those values here. So it should try it by 24, ended with FF, GBA. And it would be good if I use like bit fields or something, but I don't think they're guaranteed to be packed together in a form that these are always going to be in order. So that's why I'm not using bit fields and have to manually shift and mask, but such is life. We'll say these are going to be the ending colors. RGB and A, then we want to alert between them. And that will be whatever the wiki page said, one minus T times V zero plus t times v1, 1 minus t times v0 would be, we want to do it for RGB and A. So v0 would be our start color, I think, start to end, plus t times v1 would be the ending color, so that's our final r. So I'm just going to make all these constants, might as well. We'll do r for return, I'll just say return red would be this. I think these should be handled, but I might just put parentheses to make it extra explicit. I want to group these together, and then you can add them after you evaluate them. So I have G, B, and A, same for these, G, B, A, G, B, A. Okay, and then we want to return the final form of them sort of put together, so we'll shift that over. 24, and we'll or that with green, shifted right, shifted left by 16. Or that with blue, shift left by 8, or that with a. And even though those are 8 bit, we know that we're returning a UN32, so it'll allocate that space and it'll make sure that these all line up within that 32 bit number. So, okay, that's kind of how we lerp between two colors, but we do need to get two colors to lerp from and to. So for our chip 8, we only have some booleans that say if the pixel is on or off. And that does affect if we're going to draw it or not. But I will have to put some extra space here, unfortunately. Probably a lot of extra space. <laughs> About 8K. 2K times 4. 2K times 4 bytes. And I'm going to call these pixel colors. Or pixel color, I guess. So these will be chip 8 pixel color, colors to draw. So there's probably better ways of doing this without taking up like 8K more space, but you know, oh well, I already have this big object. What's another 8K, right? I have enough stack space on my machine, I think. Hopefully you do as well. So lurping between the default monochrome white and black will give shades of gray, right? Differing shades of gray between both. But going like red to yellow or something would give, you know, in between, it might give like shades of orange or something. It won't really be noticeable. But it should still work for other colors, not just white and black. This should be a general general function. Uh, but okay, we have that set up. Um, I'm going to make the, the sort of lerp value, the, the T here for time that we're not doing. I'm going to make that configurable, just because it could be something we want to mess with. I'm going to set it here. It is a float, and we'll say lerp rate or amount or something. I'll say rate. So amount to lerp colors by, could call it color lerp rate, be more specific. And I'm going to say it's going to be bounded between 0, 0 and, well, 0, 0.0, 1.0, inclusive on both ends. 
So although you, you will be able to put in other amounts, like, you know, five or 10 or something here, really it's meant to work between zero and one. And really not even zero, I think stuff stops and start and stops drawing. So I'll say between like 0.1 and 1.0. And we can just have maybe like 10 levels just change by 0.1 each time. So, okay, let's do set config. I'll set up that default here. Color lerp rate. And I'll set that to somewhere in the middle, 0.5. Well, I think towards the higher end, it, it looks all right. It, if you set this to 1.0, it would, it will sort of be the same as not affecting this at all. So one minus T would be zero, plus T minus ER would be whatever this value is. So really you're just setting the return equal to the end if you're lerping with a value of one. So that would be the case of there wouldn't be any change. <laughs> we won't have any colors in between the starting and end. And if we want to go fully on to fully off or vice versa, we would only go fully on or fully off with the lerp rate of a, a T value here of one. So that would be the same as it is currently. That shouldn't be any difference. If we want a difference, some amount of ghosting or whatever, then we can make a lower value. Um, the lower you go, the more of a sort of trail that you're going to leave of pixels when you move something. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Because that, that'll be what's going to happen. Normally I'd set this in between, but I'm going to do 0.7 right now. Not 7.0, that'll be way too high. Do 0.7. Color loop rates. Again, I'm going to put between, say, 0.1, 1.0 inclusive. Okay. So how do we actually set that up? Well, I'm going to say... When we init chip 8, I also need to change that. I did initialize this. Let's set the initial colors down here. I'm going to set everything to the background color just to start off. So I think it's, I called it pixel color, right? So pixel color 0, I'll give it that address. That's going to be set to the config, which I don't have coming in. Let me add config to here just so I know what color to use. So config background color, and this will be size of how many bytes we're gonna set. We're going to set a size of pixel color, which is gonna be 2K, well, times four. So yeah, we'll set up there. Background color is gonna be U132, and it'll be this many pixels to set, so that should be okay. Be initializing background color and it pixels to background color okay but we do need to pass in config for that which needs to be passed in here and that's not passed in here so I'm gonna have to do a couple couple places for that actually if we want to change values later like volume and stuff we can make it dynamic at runtime I'll pass in a, a pointer for these That'll be okay. Yeah, we'll just pass it in like that. So init chip 8 down here. I also want to pass in config. Well, I don't need to pass in a pointer. Where else did I make mistakes here? Config T pointer incompatible. 349. Here. Config T is a config. Oh, did I make it a constant? Yeah, that would be why. Okay, never mind. Well, no, wait, no, that can be a constant. I just have to dereference it to pass in the value. Yep, okay. And we have handle input, which will have the config t pointer is the second parm, so I'll add that in where we're calling it. And config. Okay, so we got that there. So right now that's not really gonna do anything. But when we go to draw, which is going to be an update screen. When we go to draw here, let's say if we're drawing, I want to set the new color for the pixel that we're going to draw. So let's say if chip 8, which I'm not passing in, am I? No, I'm passing in chip 8. Okay. So if chip 8 pixel, I'm going to change the values here. This doesn't. That's not going to be constant. Oh, this is unfortunate. Okay, that's actually going to be a pointer as well. <laughs> I think that's okay. All right, because I'm going to change the values of these display pixels. 
So okay, if chip eight pixel color i, because i is our index into display, it's also the index into the pixel colors. The same one. If that is equal to the foreground color, we don't have to do anything else. I'm gonna lerp sort of get closer to that foreground color from wherever the color currently is. So if we're going from the background to the foreground, the pixel is flipped on, then we want to go to some color in between there to give a smoother transition. That's ultimately the goal of this. So let's say if we're not equal to the foreground color yet, then I'm going to lerp to get there. Lerp towards foreground color. So we'll call color lerp, and that will be our starting color, which will be, this is not going to be a dot, this is a pointer now. So I'm going to take whatever the current color is, which, which is in pixel color i, and I want to lerp towards the foreground color at some given rate, which we set up within config, and that is the color lerp rate. We'll put it there. So what else do we have to do? I have to get the values from that because those are gonna be different and then we have to draw these here. So I did wanna save computation, but can't really do that, unfortunately. I gotta grab these. <laughs> and we'll have to put them down here. Unfortunate, that's okay. Well, I'll put it within there anyway. Okay, so let's say, we'll just call this RGB and A. We'll get rid of those. And these will be our chip eight pixel color. So chip eight, because that's the current color we're drawing. We need the values for that. And then we'll draw those three X. We'll draw those RGB and A for the rectangle. Okay. If we're drawing the outlines, I guess right now I'll still have the outlines be the plain background color. We could fade those in and out as well. I'm not going to worry about that. We'll just have these be coming in. And I'll do the same thing for the background color though here, separate from the outlines. We'll do this stuff, which I'm duplicating, so that's a sign I might be able to abstract this out a little bit. Let's say here, pixel is off, draw background color. So if our current pixel color is not the background color, I'm gonna lurk towards the background instead of the foreground, starting at the pixel color. We'll go towards the background color at that lerp rate. We'll get the new values, and we will draw these values. Okay, so that's not too bad. So this will only happen when the screen is updated here. So every time the draw flag is set, at a it'll be a maximum of 60 times a second. So if we lerp at a rate less than 1.0, it will take more than one draw update. So we'll say more than one frame to fully update. So it might take two or three frames. It depends how much drawing is gonna be updated. We'll see how that works. See how it works in, a, in practice in a second. Trying to think, because these are duplicated. I shouldn't want to do that. Pixel outlines I do, though. So we probably could put that at, well, let me let me put it to do there. Let me make sure this works first. <laughs> Move this outside, if else. And combine. Lurping, or at least reduce. Duplicate code. In this case, it's not too big of a deal, but I just want to see if I can reduce that a little bit, make it look slightly nicer. But okay. And of course, I made some issues here. So 286, 275, let's do it is a pointer. Is that up here? 286. Can't type. Six here. Yes, it is a pointer now. That is true. So where else was that? Is that it? Somewhere else. Write it first. FGA unused. Okay, so we're not using the foreground anymore. That's true. We're only using the background if we draw the outlines. That is true. We're not using these. I'll just get rid of it. We'll say grab background colors to draw outlines. Okay. So let's see what this looks like in practice. We'll try bricks again, because I only have to move left and right. I only have to remember Q and E. Ooh, that's backwards. That's not good. <laughs> I don't think that's correct. 
It is sort of a photo negative version if you want something blinding, so there's that. It's only drawing the outlines. Okay, that doesn't seem right. Let's go back. <laughs> that does not seem right. That's kind of funny, actually. I might have got the, uh, the V0 and V1 values mixed up when I was doing lerping. That could be it, of course. I'm lerping from the current one to... Oh! Yeah, I'm not setting the state within lerp. Yeah, sorry. I get mixed up. See, you usually pass in a variable to set the state. This time I'm returning the color that we're setting it to. Really obvious, duh. So I'm going to say... Oh, I'm tired. Okay. Set the color equal to this. Let me make this look a little bit better. Separate those out here. Just put them on their own lines. Okay. We want to set that equal to that. That's how the function signature works, you big dummy. Big dummy that I am. And this is background color. Okay. All right. That should be not photo negative version now. There we go. You can see up there they were gray for a second. So everything's slightly... You see some very slight ghosting. Things are... The ball is now going to be gray because it's never fully in the same place for enough frames to be other than one or two, maybe, for it to be fully lit up. And that is at a 0.7 rate. I think I'm going to make that configurable, though, since I'm passing the config into handle input now. So we can try that to see how the ghosting looks. I'm also going to look at UFO. These are just my two test games. Tetris and other sort of more static games generally look better. That's too slow. I gotta wait there. Right after a little bit for the middle of the screen, then we can hit them. But this is how this looks. And this sort of gives insight to how the UFO test for screen blur and stuff works for testing monitors. But you can see it is blinking, but it's more of a shade of gray, not fully off and on. So hopefully that helps with the flickering look a little bit. But we can change the the lerp rate, as it were. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to make that configurable. Just so we can get more constant uh, updates without having to go and recompile. And I am passing config into here. Okay, so what, what would, key would be good for that? We're using the left side. Uh, I could set like, I don't know, J and L or something. <laughs> uh, some bad keys here. Oh, well. I'll set J. I'll say J's on the left, so we'll say, well, J and K is up and down, right? Yeah. So we'll say decrease color lerp rate. So I'm going to say if the config color lerp rate is above, we're going to have 0.1 be the minimum. So I'll say if it's above 0.1, then I'm going to reduce it. We'll say we'll subtract this by 0 0.1, 0.1 to 1.0. That'll, that'll be all right. And we'll put SDLK. We'll say this will be increase the lerp rate. And if it's below 1.0, we'll increase by 0.1. Okay. The reason I don't want to go to zero is because when I was testing that, everything just stops moving. I mean, I guess we could show that, but <laughs> I'll go to point one. It'll be obvious enough. I promise you. So we'll do UFO. So the lerp rate right now is the default of 0 0.7, and I'll reduce it to 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So you can see it has a lot more ghosting. Stuff's longer lasting. It's not really the sort of CRT fade out or fade in effect that I wanted. I think I have to fade out a lot faster been over a few frames, but maybe like a, a few tens of milliseconds, not, well, a few frames would be that. Maybe like five milliseconds or less would be better. But this shows how like the ghosting works, right? <laughs> Effectively and stuff that still stays still. This does kind of give an effect of like old LCD calculator displays and stuff as well. We can increase that. If I increase all the way up to one, then it should be the same effect as if we're not doing any sort of lerp. So it should be the same default flicker effect. But I like it with a little bit. It gives it some jazz, <laughs> some some flair. 
but again, that's just a little a little fun test, right? We can reduce it by a little bit. I don't know if it really helps on stuff like this. I mean, it still flickers. It just goes between colors, not fully black and white now, but oh well. It's kind of life, right? Hopefully that's a little better, or at least if it's not, you learned a little bit or, you know, you can see how ghosting works <laughs> to some extent. And we can change them, so that's cool. Um, one other thing, the only other thing I'm going to do is make the volume configurable because that's easy enough to do. We're passing config into here. So let's do, um, I'll do ONP, sure. Let's just do that. As a final thing here, we'll say O and P. Say O will be decrease volume. We'll say if it's above zero, and I'll go by like a rate of 500. It's at 3000, so I'll probably go by, yeah, 500 or 1000 rates would be fine. It's a uint 32, I think. No, it's an int 16. But I don't want to go negative on the volume. I don't think that'll matter, but I don't want to have any weird effects from that. We'll just say zero, I think, will be silent regardless. So, okay, otherwise, I'm going to increase the volume. Increase the volume, push the tempo. Let's do, um, we'll say if we're below int 16 max, which will probably blow your speakers out, but. <laughs> will increase by 500 as well. Okay. So then you should really be able to hear this. If I turn it up a bit and we lose. Ooh. Now I don't like that effect. Now that's not a good effect. I don't think that's affecting volume. I don't know what that's doing. <laughs> Is that not config volume? We're doing positive or negative. Starts at 3,000. Oh, I'm doing color lerp rate, yeah. So that's what happens if you make the lerp rate really large. <laughs> it gives cool effects. You could mess with that on your own. I meant to do volume there, sorry about that. Obviously I can't read what I'm doing, especially if I'm trying to talk at the same time. It doesn't really work. Yeah, you should be able to hear that a little bit more now. And I'll turn it down. We can make it silent as well. And again, the delay on Ubuntu isn't really there when I run on my host or on Windows, so. But at least we have a little bit of stuff. I can give you some ideas or inspiration for uh, configurable stuff, either for resetting, which I made equals. So, you know, keybinds for reset or for volume or for a ghosting effect instead of a lerp rate, I guess I can call it ghosting. But hopefully, hopefully you learned a little bit. You maybe found it enjoyable, maybe didn't. I don't know. I'm going to probably call the episode here. Wanted it to be a sort of shorter one. This one's probably going to be closer to two hours as well. Oh, well. I did want this all in one part for sound and these visual effects, <laughs> for lack of a better word. I'll just be super ghosting here. So, okay. That's also, I guess, how they did slow down, like the Matrix effect and stuff. And... And low fidelity games. <laughs> bullet time, right? Could be used for bullet time effect if you slow down the time constant as well as this interpolation, but for other configurable stuff. I know I did not do setting stuff from the command line. And I said I was going to do that. That's like the only thing. I always miss one thing. So if we go into like set config from args, I'll say I'll have an example for like say eg set scale factor. If we're going through this and we have, you know, we have a string compare and we have, we'll do string n compare. Let's say argvi and scale factor. Then I want to grab the argument after this that was passed on the command line. So, and we'll do string length of scale factor. <laughs> Do string length for that one as the n value. So if that passed, if that passed, it would be zero, right? 
returns an int. What is the return value? An integer less than equal or greater than zero. It's match less than equal to zero. Okay. So if it equals zero, then we matched. And I would set, well, if it's a number, we, we probably should put in, <laughs> should probably add checks for numeric, but we would set something like config, I think I put, yeah, config scale factor would equal um, argv the i plus one, wouldn't it? I could increment i. Plus plus i. There we go. <laughs> and that'll increment in place, which is not great. I could set it to... I could set it to that. So we have that more be more noticeable. But we would set, you know, the scale factor from the one after this, if they sent, like, scale factor 10. So that would be all right. And that's on the first invocation. That could also be set as, like, a... If you wanted to reset the whole thing and remake the SDL window and all, or make it resizable and write code for that, then you can have this be at runtime through like a key press, like we're handling the volume and stuff. But we'll just say this is an example. And you can expand this on your own if you want to add other stuff to change these, you know, these values, like changing the square wave to another note or something. This won't be a number by default. We have to make it a number. So we can do, is it long to string? I don't remember what it was. Um, I think it's string to L is what we're supposed to do today, right? Something like that. This is an equivalent to like a string to L function. Yeah, string to L. So I can't even read Jesus. That's, this is what I was looking for. End pointer null 10. Except that A2I does not detect errors. So I can do string to L from our source null and 10. Or I can do man string to L, which is in standard lib. End pointer, I don't really care. Do we even need anything for the end pointer? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> All right, so let's pass it the string. Let's pass it null. And the base is going to be 10. And that will return a long, which scale factor is not long. It is a uint32. Well, which should be a long effectively, but I can... We'll just cast that just in case. I don't think it'll matter, but I'll do that just in case. But okay. So that should be able to set the scale factor from the command line if we do chip eight. And I know the second one has to be the ROM just from how I set up that usage statement. But after that, if we do scale factor and the default is 20, so 10 should be half as big. It should be a window like half as small. Yeah, there we go. Or if we do the same thing, 30, it should be a bit larger. So that's how you kind of do that, you know, command line arg, so. Sorry, I did, I did kind of forget to set that, didn't I? But there we go. Set the volume a little louder, even though it's delayed. I guess I'll say my small spiel again. <laughs> Thank you for watching. If you want to see chip 8 extensions like Super Chip or whatnot, let me know. Else I'll move on to something else. Or I might do it if I'm interested anyway. But yeah, hopefully you enjoyed. I'm looking forward to other emulator stuff in the future. The next one I do probably won't be in C, just to learn something else. I might do C++ or Rust or even Python, just some other language, JavaScript to do a WebAssembly something. I don't know. But another emulator thing, either for a CPU 6502Z80 or RISC-V or something, or like a, you know, game emulator, NES, uh, Game Boy or something. I'm interested in like the original Game Boy and the Game Boy Color as an add-on to that. So I might lean towards that, but it could also be something else. So if you have an idea there or any ideas there, let me know and I'll look into it. And yeah, just very appreciative and thanks for watching. <laughs> I'll see you on the next uh, whatever I do. So yeah, cheers.